He'll be giving a talk on foundation reward models for general robot skill acquisition. Uh, the floor is yours, Jason. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, Sasha and uh, Glenn, for inviting me. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here to share some of my recent work on what I consider general reward models, foundation models for general robot skill acquisition. Yeah, so this talk will be very informal. You know, feel free to stop me, ask questions at any time. Happy to make it this very, you know, interactive and uh, yeah, answer questions as I go. Yeah, so let's just jump dive, uh, jump into it. So my research goal is to develop what I consider autonomous, generous robot, right? So robots that can solve diverse, complex tasks in unstructured environments like the ones that you are seeing on this slide. So actually, these videos are super old. They're from 2010. But since then, we have made a lot of progress on using machine learning techniques for robotics. But we're still quite far from having a single robot, a model that can just do all these kind of complex tasks in any environment and be able to learn new tasks and adapt on the fly, right? And because robot tasks are so complex and so diverse in the real world, this kind of generality really demands learning at scale. And in the past couple of years, this field of learning, you know, big models that can do a lot of things has really picked up in other fields such as natural language processing and computer vision. And in the literature, many people call these models foundation model, basically large, uh, in most cases, transformers that can ingest a lot of different types of uh, data that's on the internet. And one model that can zero shot perform many tasks will be adapted with very few samples to do many different kinds of interesting tasks. And in robotics, this kind of thinking has also really picked up in the past couple of years where people have tried collecting large data sets and have one large model that can uh, ingest all these data sets and do very interesting tasks, right? So let's look at uh, some of the representative work in that literature. And by first examining, you know, data sets in robotics, right? Because to train a foundation model, we really need to have large available data sets. But data sets in robotics are typically small and scattered because unlike image or text, we just don't have that much data on the internet readily available. And each lab really has to collect their own data. But recently, this trend might be changing. For example, with the uh, very recent uh, work called OpenX Embodiment from Google Robotics and a lot of industry and university collaborators where they put together all these existing data sets into one giant data set and try to train one big model on all the available data. And using this kind of approach, we have seen positive transfer on in-distribution tasks, meaning that if you train on this large data set and the data set for the task you really care about in your own domain, the policy can do better than just training on this small data set on your particular task. But you can see that the tasks that this model and this data set is able to support are still quite simple and a short horizon, right? You know, basically pick and place and the pushing and pulling. And I think this paper is really, really good in that it provides a nice overview of the distribution and the kind of data sets that's already available in the literature. And this is, uh, I just screenshotted this picture from the paper. And you see that there are tons of robot embodiments and the data set skill types that's very underrepresented in this existing data set. And then we represent the very long tail in all the kind of tasks that we want our robots to perform in the real world. Uh, for example, if you really just care about pick, picking and placing, then this data set has abundant of data, but you wanted to do more interesting things like assembling, wiping, or turning on a faucet, then this data set really doesn't have that much data. And if you wanted to learn those skills, then this data set may not be very helpful for you. On the other side, you know, what I presented just now is data sets in robotics, meaning that these are data where robots are collecting data and, you know, gathering their own experience. But on the other hand, there are also data sets that's not coming from the robot embodiment, but it can be useful for robotics, such as readily, readily available image data set or videos of humans doing a bunch of different things in a house. These data sets don't have robots in them, but you can imagine that they can be very useful for robotics because they precisely contain the type of tasks that we want our robots to perform eventually in our houses. But these data sets are rather underutilized in the current foundation models for robotics recipe. 
So as a summary, uh, much of the effort right now is on collecting as large data set as possible for the robots that we care about, then train a large transformer-based policy model, essentially treating next action prediction as you know, next token prediction. Uh, that has been very successful in domains such as natural language processing with examples such as chat GPT or GPT-4. But what is missing from this paradigm, right? So as I alluded to, it really lacks a principled module for learning new skills and adapting existing ones. So if your skill, the skill that you care about is not in this large data set, then these large models cannot really help you learn them or doesn't provide a principled mechanism for doing so. And furthermore, it doesn't really uh, utilize alternative data sources that could be very helpful, such as human videos. And finally, it doesn't answer solving complex skills, right? As we have seen, the skills that's represented in these data sets are all very short horizon and uh, you know, uh, singleton skills that can be accomplished within a few seconds, if not shorter. But as tasks become harder, like long horizon and more dynamic, then the existing data is already more scarce and become more harder and more difficult to collect. Therefore, we really need to think about another way of training these foundation models that can provide this kind of, you know, what I call actionability to robotics. And this is what this talk will focus on. It's about training and deploying actionable foundation models for robotics. So what do I mean by actionable? I generally mean by, uh, you know, general prior that can help robots act and adapt. So it's not really about just uh, memorizing and uh, fitting on the training distribution, but rather providing more information that can help robots act and adapt new skills in new environments. And the particular angle that I will focus on is the foundation reward model angle. So why rewards, right? So rewards help specifying the task that we want to solve and provides the learning signal for robots to do so. So with reward, you can imagine solving a new task using trajectory optimization or reinforcement learning. And furthermore, reward is an entity that can generalize across embodiments because even if your robots look different, they might be trying to, or the same way of solving a task might transfer across different robots, right? And furthermore, this can readily learn from other sources of data. You don't necessarily need a robot demonstration to learn reward. You can use human videos of a, you know, a person opening a door to teach how a robot should also open that door in the form of a reward function. And if we have a foundation reward model, then you can imagine each robot can go about and autonomously learn new skills and refine existing ones in their new environment without having to pre-collected data in the particular environment for that particular skill. And this paradigm is entirely compatible with the you know, large action model paradigm where you just train the largest model possible on all your robot data, right? Because you can imagine using these foundation reward model to fine tune the large action model to be better at the new skill that you want to acquire. So this is what, uh, what I have focused on for the past year. I have really focused on trying to think about how to pre-train these large reward models that can jumpstart robot skill acquisition. So the first work I will talk about is how to pre-train a value function from human videos, and they can really serve as zero-shot goal-based reward, right? So once you have a goal image that specifies the task configuration you want to achieve in this environment, the model can provide very smooth and dense reward for every single time frame. So you can use this reward to uh, learn a policy or synthesize a trajectory. And in a follow-up work, I showed how this paradigm can readily extend to goal specification that's not an image, but rather in other modalities such as language. So in this example, you see that we can just tell the robot, okay, put the bottle on a lower shelf and the model generates a dense reward that can guide the robot to do this task. And finally, I will also show how the same kind of reward model can be used readily to decompose long horizon tasks, right? So now you can not only solve, you know, short horizon single step tasks, but also use them to solve much longer, much more complex tasks that you weren't able to do previously without more assumption and, you know, training new models in the particular environment that you care about, okay? Yeah, so now let's jump into uh, these different works. So the first work I will talk about is VIP towards universal visual representation and reward via value implicit pre-training. So this was a work that appeared in iClear 2023 this year. 
And it's the first work in you know, this line of work that have done on pre-training value function that can provide zero-shot lower functions for robotics manipulation, right? So the high-level idea in this work is that we want to learn what I'd consider universal temporal value function. So given a current observation and a goal image, this value function essentially captures how far away in time are the current frame from the goal frame. So why is doing something like this desirable, right? Because this value function is goal condition. So if you train this on enough data, then you should capture a very general notion of goal-directed task progress, like a transfer across tasks and embodiment. And because we wanted to learn this value function, we must have also acquired a rich visual representation. So you can express this value function in the first place. Right, because you can imagine if your representation is not very good, then you won't be able to distinguish two observations that look very similar, but have very different values, like how far away in time they are from the same goal frame. And then finally, once you have trained this value function, then because value functions essentially can be treated as a reward function, you can use them to specify the reward for a new task and use your favorite policy learning algorithm, let it be reinforcement learning or trajectory optimization to solve a new task, okay? But the challenge is that if you wanted to do this from just robust data, then as I alluded, there's not enough of them. And there's probably not enough robot data to generalize to new unseen tasks, right? But what we can do instead is pre-train this value function on in the wild human videos that's readily available on say YouTube where people are just going on about their daily lives and doing many different things. And because human videos are naturally goal-directed, right? Because humans here are actually trying to accomplish certain tasks. So you can imagine this is the perfect data set to try to pre-train a value function that can zero-shot transfer to unseen robotics tasks. And that is exactly what uh, VIP does. It's uh, proposing this idea of treating representation learning as learning value function. So what happens is you essentially have a visual encoder fee that can take in an image and then you would compute their distance in the representation space as the value function. So you are encoding this value function in the distance of the representation space, right? So this is at a high level what value implicit pre-training where VIP is trying to do. The uh, precise objective does not really matter in this case, but it's really about the idea of trying to learn value function from non-robot data. And VIP is the first work that's able to do so. And because we're trying to pre-train a huge amount of human videos, this value function, as we will show, does transfer zero shot to unseen robot domains. All right. So before we go into any qualitative results, once you have trained this uh, re visual representation to encode the value function, that in your downstream task, right, you can just take the value of the next observation and subtract the value of the current observation to get you a per step dense reward that can guide you towards solving a robot task, right? You can imagine if the current transition is actually making progress towards solving the task G, then this uh, difference in value should be positive, right? Guiding you towards solving the task. So how well does this actually do, right? So here's some uh, example of uh, VIP pre-trained on human videos and directly transferred to robot, unseen robot videos across various domains, right? You can see this is a real video. And in the bottom two, these are just a simulated video that's obviously not in the training data set. And just treating the last goal, last frame in this video as its goal and computing the you know, pairwise distance as you traverse along the video, you see that these are very, very smooth, you know, uh, curves, meaning that if you actually try to optimize against these curves, you're very you're not likely to get stuck in a local optima can, and can actually pro, uh, get a trajectory that would progress towards the final goal image that you care about, right? And indeed, if you compare the embedding distance of the VIP representation with other pre-trained representations in the literature, such as you know ResNet, Clip, Remoco. Right, you see that the curve from VIP is much more smooth compared to the alternative representations on the same video. And this means that VIP is more likely to be able to be used as a zero shot reward function. Whereas the other ones, if you try to use them, then because they're highly non-smooth, 
And as the video progresses, actually exhibits you know, the opposite trend, you're very likely to get stuck in a local optimum and without being able to actually reach the final goal image if you use this as a reward function. And this is exactly what we'll show in our uh, some of our quantitative results. So first of all, we test this on simulation. So we have these Franca kitchen environments where there are many tasks that can be solved in a single environment. And we use uh, different camera views to specify the goal and see whether or not the visual reward model that we have is robust to different camera view. And you know, we don't provide any reward or stage instrumentation. So you have to solve all these tasks from purely vision and from purely a single goal that specifies the task. And as I talked about, we compare against many state-of-art visual representation at the time. And for each representation, we basically use the difference in embedding distance as a reward function that you can construct from each representation, right? So using different choices of representation and using trajectory optimization to optimize against this reward function. You see that using VIP's reward function, you can solve significantly more tasks compared to using alternative forms of um, pre-trained reward model. And these are totally zero shot results. We have never tried to fine tune the pre-trained model on the particular task or domain that we cared about, right? And furthermore, you know, in trajectory optimization, there is the optimization budget that you can tune for, right? You can search for, let's say three iterations where you can search for more iterations and have more, you know, action trajectory as samples to increase your optimization budget. And we have this interesting experiment where we show if you make your search procedure more powerful, then the VIP reward model can actually solve more tasks. But if you do the same thing for the baselines, you actually don't solve more tasks indicating that the baselines actually have more local optima in the rewarded landscape. So if you make your search procedure more powerful, then you're more likely to actually exploit those local minima and actually not solve the task. But, but whereas for VIP, the performance actually just monotonically improves as your optimization becomes stronger, indicating that the rewarded landscape that VIP is able to acquire by learning a principled value function in the latent space is very smooth and allows you to generalize unseen tasks. Yeah, so here are some qualitative results of the learned behavior. So uh, for each row, the left image is the goal image that's fed as in the you know, task specifier. And here is the trajectory that the VIP reward is able to discover. And here's a trajectory that you would discover using an alternative choice of reward model. You see that in all cases, the VIP is able to solve the task, whereas the baseline reward model fails to do so, and often incurs negative consequences in the environment, such as knocking the kettle off the table. Okay. And we tried the same experiment with online reinforcement learning instead of trajectory optimization. So the issue with trajectory optimization is that you're only optimizing for one trajectory. So if you get stuck in a local minima as you are doing this online model predictive control, then you won't be able to like get out of it. But with reinforcement learning, you can do this trial and error exploration. But the downside is that now in reinforcement learning, you must also learn a visual-based policy. So the representation with a reward model you're learning must also provide state encoding. So it's a more demanding task compared to trajectory optimization. But here we show that using VIP as both the visual reward and the visual representation for policy is quite effective. And again, significantly outperforms competitive baselines, right? So this, this is why, you know, treating value learning as learning representation really matters, right? Because it essentially gives you both a visual reward model that you can use and also a visual representation that you can readily use to encode your visual observation without having to learn this representation from scratch. So it really jumpstarts your visual policy learning with a pre-trained model without any domain-specific engineering or fine-tuning. And finally, we put VIP into the real world and are trying to do offline reinforcement learning in the real world. So before we go to offline RL, let's talk about why offline RL is really difficult in the real world. Because typically offline RL is not data efficient. 
in the sense that even though it's the data-driven paradigm of reinforcement learning, you still need it even like a million transitions on simulated benchmark in, you know, mutual code. And offline RL is most effective when you actually have dense reward. So if you don't have dense reward, then typical offline RL techniques, such as, you know, conservative Q learning or, you know, those kind of TD-based methods are very likely to diverge. And it's also much harder to implement and attune than behavioral cloning. So for this reason, behavioral cloning or imitation learning is still the dominant approach for real world robotics. But I think with something like VIP, this can all change because VIP provides you a useful reward function and also gives you a visual representation. So it makes the uh, imitation learning pipeline much simpler and allows you to do more than imitation learning because you have reward information now that allows you to, to not just fit every action equally, but rather selectively fit action that might be more useful towards solving your task, right? So this is exactly what we did in our paper where we introduced this method called VIP reward weighted regression, where instead of just doing, you know, maximum likelihood on your action, you additionally weigh your transition by the reward from VIP. And the intuition is that this allows the policy learning to pay more attention to keyframe if the reward information is good, right? Like for example, in the frame that you pick up the watermelon, then the reward should be high if your reward is good because this is a very essential action towards placing the watermelon in the plate. Because if you didn't pick up the watermelon, then you couldn't have placed it in the plate, right? And this is a very trivial change from doing behavior cloning. You essentially just had to add one more line in the implementation. So if your BC implementation is good and workable, then this is also very simple to implement on top of it. Unlike other offline RL algorithms, that's really hard to implement, and it had to tune a lot of hyperparameters. And here are the results, right? Uh, so the VIP RWR results is this column. You see that it outperforms using the VIP model to do imitation learning, where you just don't use its reward information. And furthermore, this does a lot better than just training the VIP model from scratch using the in-domain data where you don't use the pre-training from human videos at all, right? This shows how pre-training is actually necessary to do few shot offline reinforcement learning in the real world where you don't have uh, too much data to train your policy and where if you do that, you would just severely overfit and not solve any task, right? And this is the first demonstration of few shot offline reinforcement learning in the real world. And the VIP is actually very effective for doing so. And in comparison, the baseline, you know, you can do the same procedure, but it's not nearly as effective as VIP, especially under harder tasks. And here I will show some videos of, you know, uh, using VIP to do reward weighted regression versus using it to the BC and the baseline. And, um, uh, these videos are quite long because we have all the royalties in one video, but if you go on the project website, you'll see the behavior is much more smooth and it solves the task at much higher rate. Uh, yeah, so here's, uh, let me see if these videos will play. Yeah, I think I have to click on each one for this one, but yeah. But the point is, you know, uh, without doing any additional work, we can, more reliably solve the task, especially on these kind of tasks where there's a keyframe, key action that you do need to perform. Because if you didn't pick up the towel, you wouldn't be able to fold it. And with the reward where you do regression, we can really pay attention to these key actions and allow much more robust execution in solving these tasks, right? Yeah, so, so far I have presented VIP, a pre-trained value function that can serve as a zero shot reward model that can jumpstart your robot learning procedure whether or not you wanted to do a trajectory optimization, online RL or offline RL without any domain specific reward engineering or you know, a large amount of data in your particular task and just allows you to do few shot learning very fast. But I think there are some issues with the way that the tasks are specified in the VIP framework, right? Recall that in VIP, every single task is specified via a goal image. So here is an example of a goal image that I provided in the in my own kitchen actually, right? So this is the current image and this is a goal image. So from these two images, what do you think the task is, right? So you might tell me, okay, the task is actually just opening the microwave. But if you actually squinted at these two pictures close enough, you'll notice that there's actually another, you know, 
object on the table that's removed from the goal image. So if you only provided the goal image as your task specification, it's ambiguous what the actual task you wanted to solve is, right? Like for example, is the task just opening the microwave door or is it opening precisely to this angle and also removing this object from the you know, a kitchen countertop, right? So this is a challenge with providing image goal as task specification because you're forced to pay attention to everything that's happening in the goal image and often over specify the task and then uh, making distractor object that's not actually relevant to the user intent as part of the goal specification. And this is not desirable in many cases, especially if you think about uh, providing, uh, we're allowing human users who are not roboticists to provide the task specification for the home robots. They won't understand or be uh, paying attention to these very little details. So instead of providing image goal as the task specification, what if we can also provide language goal that really abstracts away everything from the uh, your environment that's not relevant to the task? Like for example, to place the watermelon on the plate, instead of providing image where the watermelon is on the plate, which is you know kind of difficult to provide and very laborious, so let's just tell the robot, okay, the task is the string watermelon on the plate. And this is exactly the kind of thing that we wanted to achieve in the follow-up work to VIP, which is titled LIV, Language Image Representations and the Rewards for Robotic Control, where we extended the VIP framework to also handle multimodal goal specification. And in this particular case, language goal. And, uh, and again, this is a collaboration with my collaborators at Meta and also my PhD advisors. Mm -hmm. Jason, do you mind if we ask a question or two about the previous project? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Feel free to interrupt at any time. Yeah, maybe this is a good point to stop and take some questions first. Yeah, one, one thing I was wondering about was for the VIP model, was yeah. there something about the representation learning process that like more so guarantees it learns a good value function? Like, is there yeah. ever a case where it develops a non-optimal reward function where you can still have local minima? But you say a lot of the prior methods have more cases of that. Yeah, so I didn't go into the exact objective in the VIP, but it's uh, derived from a prior work of mine that learns the, that tries to learn the optimal goal condition value function from offline data, right? So in that sense, the VIP objective will give you the optimal value function modulo, you know, representation error, right? Like, you know, your, your network is not capable enough to capture the optimal value function. So minus the approximation error, the VIP objective has been shown in my own prior work that it will capture the optimal value function. So in that sense, it will be the maximally smooth representation that you can get from training on your particular data. And the reason why it's not always smooth is because, you know, we are operating in the purely zero shot regime, right? where we try to transfer from a value function that's trained purely on human videos to robotic videos. So there will necessarily still be local minima, but as we have seen, it's much less frequent than other pre-trained representation. So it's actually capable as a reward model. Yeah, so if we pour more data into the method, like you said, doing it online and collecting data should develop a better uh, representation and- That's right, value. that's right, yeah. So the VIP objective is uh, purely self-supervised. So you have more data. And if you have robot data, right, that's even better, right? You can, you know, just use the robot data to do the VIP objective again. But the cool thing about VIP is that it doesn't depend on action to train the value function. So that's what allows you to pre-train on human videos, where obviously you don't have action labels, right? But if you have more robot data, you can also apply the same paradigm. And I, actually I'll show, uh, that application in the LIV case, in the live case, where we find fine tuning to actually be very helpful because you know when you go to do, doing dealing with language, there's all kinds of issues that pop up. So yeah, maybe this is a good point to dive into that. So any more questions before I continue? Okay, yeah. So now let's talk about. Uh, okay, was there a question? No, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so actually the live um, work is actually very simple conceptual if we under have understood VIP, right? 
Recall that in VIP, we treat representation learning as learning this implicit value function in the latent space. And you're just learning a single encoder that, that's like a visual encoder, right? So in the live case, we're just doing representation as multimodal value function. So instead of a single encoder, now you just have two encoder, one that encodes images and the one that encodes language. And again, in the representation space, you are trying to capture the embedding distance. But now instead of with respect to just the image goal, this goal could be a text as well, right? So this is a very simple modification. And at a practical level, what you have to do is essentially combining the VIP objective with the clip objective, right? So if you are not familiar with the clip, it's a method to align image and it's matching language description in the representation space. And in the paper, we have theoretical guarantee on why combining VIP and a clip is actually a very, very good idea. So uh, before, uh, so without going to the technical detail, the high level guarantee is that clip is actually a special case of VIP when instead of training on video data, you're training on static image data. So this kind of uh, theoretical result allows us to gracefully combine VIP and a clip and show that they actually work together to learn a very rich uh, multimodal representation that captures temporal progress towards accomplishing language goals, right? But so um, for the live case, we pre-trained again like VIP on this Epic Kitchen data set where you have humans accomplishing various tasks and this data set comes with a language annotation that describes what the humans are doing these tasks, which is, you know, what you need to do live type of pre-training because now you need language annotation. So without going into these technical details, I will just tell you that because of the connection with CLIP, we actually initialize the live architecture or model from the CLIP architecture and then just parameterize the embedding distance cosine similarity, which is what's done in CLIP. And then basically allows a cosine similarity based distance metric to now capture value function. And everything else is very similar to VIP. Okay, so now let's see this in action, right? Whether or not the pre-trained live can serve as multimodal reward function. So here we have some videos from, you know, the unseen testing split of Epic Kitchen. And here's the task of opening the microwave. You see, you know, as the video progresses towards opening the microwave, then embedding distance suddenly decreases, right? Indicating, that, okay, we're actually much, much closer towards opening the microwave. And the bottom one is very interesting because, right, in the middle, right, as we have opened the microwave door, the distance actually at its lowest point. But as the camera sh is shifting away from the microwave door, where at the end, it's no longer obvious, right? At this frame, it's no longer obvious that this is even a microwave anymore, right? Then embedding distance actually climbs up, indicating that the model has really captured the notion of opening a microwave that can generalize across, you know, visual shifts when the video where the frame is no longer apparent that is trying to solve opening the microwave, the distance will go back up, right? But this is you know, not possible to capture with image goal because in all these cases, the image goal is just the last frame in this video. So in this case, the language goal and the image goal are actually capturing semantically very different things. But this is you know, what's actually very powerful with language goal because it allows you to you know, semantically capture what we actually intend as humans instead of, you know, overfit into what's presented in the image, okay? And yeah, we have like a lot of examples. Here's just an opening the cabinet. Again, you see, you know, reasonably smooth progress towards the language goal. But obviously this curve is not as smooth as, you know, the image goal one, right? That is because with image goal, there is no language grounding issue. Right. Your image goal is from the same video, but for uh, the language goal, open cabinet, you know, has been trained to, you know, map to the uh, visual progress in many, many videos that have the same language annotation. So it's not very tailored towards your particular video. So uh, you're going to see more, you know, non-smooth artifacts in these videos. But what I found impressive is that even just by pre-training on these human videos, we actually already see zero shot transfer, just like in the VIP case to unseen robot videos, right? So here are some videos that I took from another project that's totally unrelated to 
um, the live project. And we see that in these totally out of domain zero shot cases, we're able to capture a visual progress towards what's captured in the language annotation indicated by you know, a sudden drop in the embedding distance as you know, the bottle's actually on the lower shelf, we have higher distance, a uh, lower distance. So you can imagine, you can use this reward function to optimize your robot trajectory for solving the language specified task. Okay, yeah, so here are just more examples. If for the interest of time, I'll skip it. And as a corollary to Liv's capability to uh, predict progress towards language goal, you can also detect a state change in your object, right? Like in this video, you see that the fridge doors open and then close. So you see that the distance with respect to the language opening the fridge will first go down, then go back up, which is exactly what, what you would expect. But since the image goal is the last frame in the video, and in the last frame of the video, the fridge is actually closed, you see exactly the opposite pattern to emerge, right? So just by trying to capture a value function in the latent space, you automatically get this, you know, what I consider a success detector for free, right? Here's another example where you open and close, then, you know, it has the uh, going down and the going back up. And then the image is the exact opposite track which I think is really cool. And then, but, you know, language-based reward doesn't always work out of the box. And the, precisely it's the issue of language grounding, right? Like for example, uh, let's say in the pre-training set, like at the kitchen, we have never seen, you know, this precise language command lift the towel off the hook. And if in your environment, you know, the drawer looks very, very different from all the drawers in the pre-training data set, then the model has trouble grounding what a drawer is in this particular environment. And in those cases, your language reward will no longer be informative. And that is, you know, um, that is inevitable because what a language stream means is really context dependent. So if your pre-training data set is not big enough, then there will necessarily be grounding issue. And Epic Kitchen is actually not a huge data set compared to you know, all these image language data sets that's already out there. Like Epic Kitchens came out like maybe five years ago at this point. And it's really just people doing things in kitchen. So if you go out of the kitchen scenario, doing tasks that you wouldn't normally see in a kitchen, then the model will no longer be able to generalize. And this is especially true once you go to simulation domain, where the what a microwave looks like is really, really different from what it would have appeared in Epic Kitchen. So in these cases, we see that there's really the need for in-domain fine tuning of the lift model, right? Like Glenn has alluded to, this is the case where if you have robot data in domain that's language annotated, will be very useful to further shape the lift representation. And because live objective is very, uh, it's totally unsuper is self-supervised. Uh, if you have more robot data, we can just readily apply it to fine tune the live representation. And in the paper, we have some theoretical justification as to why using the live objective is the correct way to fine tune on robot data, where the data is just, you know, temporal in nature, whereas the clip objective, which only focuses on matching image and a language annotation, would essentially ignore the temporal nature of the live represent of the robot data and learns a much more uh, degenerate representation. But for, uh, for the interest of time, I won't go into the detail, but I'll just provide you some qualitative examples of you know, what happens after you fine tune the live representation. So here is a robot video that we collected in lab. And here the video is trying to show a pair being placed into a black pot. You see that you know, this language reward is very, very noisy, right? But once you have fine tuned on uh, just a handful of trajectory in the robot data set, you'll see that the reward becomes much, much smooth. And now you see that the language reward and the image reward are actually highly correlated, meaning that now they're able to capture semantically a uh, very similar notion of goals. And because now the rewards are much smoother, you can actually use these as reward function to train your policies, right? And that's exactly what we did. And here's some, uh, instead of reward results, we have some policy learning results as well, right? We call that in live, the reward where the value is implicitly represented 
from the representation. So once you fine tune lib, you are also getting a better representation to do uh, policy learn in general. So here we show cases where for the same you know, object configuration, we wanted to do language condition behavior cloning with a pre-trained representation versus the fine tuned representation. You see that as we fine tune the representation to capture better rewards, it also serves as a better encoder for even if you just wanted to do imitation learning when you have a lot of you know, demonstration data, right? But what if you don't have demonstration data? Then we can still use the reward function to do model predictive control. And without going into much of the detail, you know, using the lib rewards, fine tune rewards to the NPC, you achieve much higher success rate compared to using other fine tuned reward model in two simulated benchmarks, right? So I have shown that when you have language, you can probably do better by doing some sort of fine tuning. And once you fine tune the lift model, it's a better representation for imitation or learning and a better reward model to do model predictive control, showing the versatility of this model to support various kinds of uh, robot skill learning, whether or not you have data for the particular skill that you care about. Okay, yeah, so before I go into the final work, I will pause again for some questions. I guess I had well, at least one quick question. So you do the yeah. fine tuning part here. Maybe I was wondering, like, do you promote collecting data on the real robot hardware for those fine tuning tasks, or would human data work well enough of someone moving those objects around? Yeah, so I think that's a very interesting question that we have never tried. So I think if you just have human doing these same tasks in the particular environment, I think that will work. Right, because what's really happening here is just like these are like you know fake fruits, right? These are like plushy toys, right? So in your Epic Kitchen, we probably have never seen a you know a pineapple that looks like this. But even if you just have a human manipulating pineapple in the test environment, then that already allows the grounding of what a pineapple is in this environment to happen, right? It can probably be embodiment independent. But we have never tried that. In all these cases, we just use the robot demonstration to fine tune the lift model and then use the fine tune representation to solve the tasks that were you know, uh, used for fine tuning. But yeah, I think that will be very interesting to explore. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there are yeah. other questions. One other one that I was wondering about. Yeah. Well, you kind of separated the planning problem into two parts now. Because, you know, when you learn an RL policy or even a behavior cloning one, you need to figure out the policy or agent needs to figure out the dynamics and then the value function or Q function. Yeah. So in some ways, a bit of the work you're doing here is also saying, you know, learning the value function is part of the harder problem. And how can you get away with learning that in a supervised manner? Can you mm -hmm. talk a bit about that for a second? Uh... So it's the question like, how do we learn uh, dynamics like, model? Do you think one yeah. way to make robot learning a lot more efficient is to focus on these models that are like learning value functions? And that's mm -hmm. the harder part than learning the dynamics or figuring out sequential decision-making problems. So I think uh, they're very related, right? Like, uh, I think learning the value function is a part of, you know, learning dynamics model and the learning sequential decision problem, right? Like value function, Q function, they capture some information about the dynamics, right? But it's really about learning the portions of, you know, the environment dynamics that's the most informative about solving a task, right? Because in sequential decision-making, you're typically trying to maximize your return or maximize your Q uh, value. And if you can directly just learn these value functions uh, first, then you can use them to do various kinds of policy learning without having to necessarily fit a dynamics model, which I think is like a harder task, right? Because to learn a perfect dynamics model, you necessarily have to capture things that may not be relevant to your particular task. And learning value function is like the very nice intermediate point where you abstract away a lot of unnecessary thing, but it's also flexible enough that you can also do pre-training. But I think as you alluded to, a way to combine value-based pre-training with pre-training dynamics model together can probably deliver even better performance, right? Because in these, in the, all the examples I've shown you, with the value function, you still have to do online RL, 
offline RL or imitation learning, which is, you know, still requires a lot of samples and data collection. But with a pre-trained dynamics model that's good enough, you can just entirely plan within the dynamics model and then just zero shot execute in the real world. So I think that's the natural next step. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so far I have shown you, you know, a real robot, uh, real robot results in, you know, all these different environments. But what you will notice that in all these tasks, they're quite simple. They're mostly, you know, pick and place kind of thing. We're pushing, we're just, you know, folding one time and they're very short horizon. So a natural question is, can we scale these models up to solving much more complex and perhaps long horizon tasks, right? And that's exactly what we have attempted in this very new work that we'll actually be on archive next week. So we figured out a way to use these pre-trained value models as what we call universal visual decomposer, basically providing a automatic way to decompose your long horizon manipulation task into uh, chunks of short horizon that allows you to learn these long horizon manipulation tasks much better, okay? So how do we go about that? So the key idea is that pre-trained value functions are actually excellent as sub-goal decomposer. What do I mean by that? So recall that the VIP embedding distance is actually very smooth, very monotonic for singleton task. So if you try to apply the VIP representation a very long horizon task, then there will be natural breaks from this smoothness. And these breaks actually can be indicative of when the phase shift has happened in a task, okay? So let's take this you know, video as an example where it is just really many stages happening in this task, right? And so if you try to plot the VIP distance, right? This is what it looks like. It's very, very different from the very monotonic smooth, smooth functions or smooth curves that I have shown you previously. But what we have realized is that if you look at this embedding distance from the end to the beginning, whenever there is like a point where the non-monotonicity happens, that actually does correspond to visually meaningful sub-goals in these tasks, right? So that's what happens here. We just recursively go back to the first point where the curve actually goes in the opposite direction. And we just chop the demonstration there and take the image that's happened at this frame and take that as a sub-goal. And then from this sub-goal, we again compute the embedding distance going backward. And then again, stop at the first frame where the uh, embedding distance will go in the opposite direction. And you see the sub-goal that we discovered. Again, it's like very semantically meaningful, right? And we just keep doing that from the end to the beginning until we don't have any more you know, frame to do this thing. And the sub goals that we have discovered in this manner are actually very semantically meaningful and it can be used to break up your task and allow you to compositionally generalize at test time to unseen orders of these sub goals, right? And I think this is a very cool work because we have shown a novel way of using these pre-trained value models that allow you to scale up to very interesting tasks as we will show. And here's just another example, right? Where the vanilla, embedding curve is very not indicative, but once you go from backward and try to break up these embedding curves into different segments, then all the intermediate sub goals you discover are the, you know, what humans would consider as the sub stages in the task. Okay. And this is the intuition that we have formalized in this paper. We basically take these raw long horizon video, do backward recursive decomposition using the embedding distances signal, then once we discover these sub goals, we again go forward in time using these sub goals to learn goal condition policies and use these sub goals to compositionally generalize at test time, the unseen goal orders. Okay. And I think what is really cool is that if you think about how you typically would solve long horizon manipulation, then you really have to do a lot of domain specific engineering with human coming in labeling, okay, these are the sub goals in these demonstrations. And we're trained like a generative model in your target domain that can you know, figure out what are the sub goals in your latent space. But with this model, you essentially don't have to do any extra training or any huge amount of data to allow you to do sub goal discovery or target task. You just take the pre-trained model totally off the shelf and just decompose sub goals. 
And this readily allows compositional generalization in similar real environments that we will show. And again, once you break up the long horizon task into short horizon, you can again use the each individual sub goal to specify a goal conditioned reward for that particular stage and allow you to use reinforcement learning to solve very long horizon tasks without reward engineer. So uh, given the time limit of this talk, I will mostly focus on some of the real world results. Yeah, so let's just look at that. So we have collected three real world multi-stage tasks on a real Franco robot. So here are what the tasks look like. They typically consist of you know, three to four stages. And here we just show you the universal visual decomposer or UVD in action. You see that the original VIP rewards are you know, not monotonic, but once you go backward in time and it uses the decompose, you discover useful sub goals and they can be used to, again, learn each individual stage using imitation learning or reward-weighted regression. And furthermore, you can use these sub goals to specify new sequence at test time. So we'll look at that. Um, yeah, so here are some uh, successful rollouts from our method. And for all the results, we just do vanilla goal condition behavior cloning. And the only difference is whether or not uh, you use the sub goals that we discovered to condition this GCBC policy, where you just use uh, GCBC policies trained on the last frame of all these demonstrations and without you know, trying to discover what are useful sub goals. And we indeed see that when you use our sub goal decomposition to supplant GCBC, you have much higher success rate and complete more stages of the task. And that's pretty consistent across all of our you know, different tasks that we have tried, which are much more difficult and much more varied compared to the original set of tasks in the VIP paper or in the live paper, okay? And here's, uh, I think the most interesting and the most challenging, you know, deformable multi-stage manipulation, right? And in this window, it's, you know, all the different sub goal that's currently conditioned for the policy. And all these sub goals are, you know, discovered at training time by the UVD method. Right. By breaking up the task, we can solve more of it. And so far, what I have shown you are uh, just basically trying to solve the sequence that's in the training demonstration. Right. You want to fold from, uh, you know, totally laid out flat. You first do the diagonal fold and quarter fold and eighth fold. But I think what sub goal decomposition allows you to do is to generalize to unseen combinations or orders of these tasks. Right. Because with the semantically meaningful sub goal, a human user can come in and specify a new sequence if they wanted to. And that's exactly uh, the most interesting experiment that we wanted to showcase. So originally for all the demonstrations, these are the configurations, right? So we wanted to test whether or not we can just allow, whether or not the same policies can generalize to unseen initial states where some stage of the task has already been solved for the robot, right? So in this case, the app was already placed in the place. So you don't have to do the first stage. And in this example, you know, the fries are already on the final plate. So you didn't have to pick up the plate and then port it into the, you know, uh, plate again. And in the folding example, the first fold is already done for you. So these are generalization cases where we actually make the task shorter. So the robot, if they're intelligent, must be able to skip a stage that's already trained for, instead of you know uh, having to redo them. But subtasks, then you would imagine that first, these are unseen configuration, so the policy doesn't generalize. And second, they would try to redo a stage of the task that's already been solved. So that's wasteful, okay? Yeah, so here's what happens, right? You know, since the first stage has already been done for us and with sub goal decomposition, the robot has already realized, okay, we can skip the first stage and immediately condition on the later sub goals that we have discovered and then still successfully, you know, solve maybe 20 25% of the 20 royals and reach an average completion rate of, you know, 63%. Whereas for the baseline, right, because it has always been conditioned on the same end goal, then the initial configuration now is totally out of domain. So its execution is much less robust. And I think these are more interesting case, right? So in this case, because the fry has already been poured into the plate, 
our policy is able to directly pick up the ball and place it onto the rack without trying to, you know, kind of do the pouring motion that you have seen previously. Whereas for the baseline policy, you know, it just gets stuck, right? And finally, it's the same thing with the uh, folding task, where since we already done the first folding, we are able to, the model is able to figure out the condition directly on the second fold and the third fold. And it's still able to successfully solve these very complex folding tasks purely from, you know, vision without any, you know, folding specific tricks. Whereas for, you know, the baseline, right? Even though it's um, the first fold is already done for you, it's very not intelligent. It still tries to go to the original location where this edge is and try to do that pick, right? Indicating that the baseline policy has overfit to the particular set of motion that we had at a training time and doesn't really generalize. And what I've, this is like a cool experiment that's done by you know, uh, the students who have led the work where, uh, yeah, actually on this paper, I wasn't the lead author. I was doing more like a, an advisory role. So in this case, uh, the student, Green Sean, actually um, you know, stepped in and it did the second task for the robot, right? Right. You see that you know once the robot completed the first stage, uh, Yun Shuang came in and did a second stage for the robot. And then because we are trained on these semantic sub goals, the robot can immediately just transition to the next sub goal without trying to redo the intermediate task, right? And here's another cool example where again, you know, starting from scratch, the robot pick it up, but Yun Shuang just came in and put the fries into the plate for the robot then the robot can immediately just pick up the slack and go to the next stage, showing that with sub code decomposition, it really gives you this intelligent behavior where the robot can tell when a sub goal has accomplished and then go to the next one. And all this is done with just a pre-trained value model that give you these sub goals without any additional training in your particular environment, okay? Yeah, so as a summary, I have shown you this framework of value pre-training for zero-shot goal-based reward entirely from human videos. And I have shown you one extension where we, where we make this multimodal. So you can also con additionally condition a language goal. And a second application where we use these reward uh, pre-training value models to do off-the-shelf subtask sub decomposition. So now you can solve much longer horizon tasks and a compositionally generalize at test time. Right. So in summary, I have presented value pre-training as a powerful instantiation of foundation reward models that can work across uh, different environments and different tasks. But I think this is just the start for really trying to pre-train uh, general prior for robotics. Right. And there are many things we can do on top of what I have presented, for example, adding structure to value learning, like adding combining object-centric representation to value learning to learn more structured and modular reward model, and then combining this value function idea that really informs low-level action with large language models that may be very good at specifying high-level semantic tasks, right? And also, since we are training reward models, we need to think about, you know, uh, fine-tuning the reward from human feedback and making sure the reward functions actually align with human intent, where, you know, we need to think about safety concerns for optimizing robots against a fixed reward function in practice. And you know, there are a lot of uh, more directions that we can do. And yeah, I have been working on some of these directions and maybe you'll see some of them online very soon. Yeah, and that's it for the presentation. I'm happy to take more questions at the end. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Jason. Yeah. Uh, see, Samuel has his hand raised, so maybe we can start from Samuel. Hi, Jason. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, good, good to, see, to you. see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed by the, I mean, I'm very familiar with your uh, work on VIP already. Uh, yeah. I'm very impressed by the, the last uh, part, which I, I obviously didn't didn't know about yet. Yeah. Um, that That's really cool. Um, I was wondering if, um, your how sensitive uh, the the this sub goal good decomposition is to uh, hyperparameters to uh, per task because I'm not sure uh, I don't I don't know uh, if you are specifying as a hyperparameter the number of sub goals or what is the way you are uh, breaking down 
uh, uh, the the goals and uh, I was thinking for the task with the folding, for example, it's very discrete the number of sub goals you should have that if uh, um, it, it it's robust to different uh, or you can use the same the same initialization of pi or hyperparameters across. Yeah, uh, so I think there are two things. Yeah, so one uh, hyperparameter definitely matters. Like you know, uh, when do you decide to cut off, right? And uh, how many, like how far in time you want to discover sub goals, right? So like one thing we do is like whenever we discover a sub goal, we say okay, over the next time frame, we're not going to discover a new sub goal, right? Otherwise, you might have too many sub goals, right? So there's definitely a hyperparameter, uh, some hyperparameters that need to be set. But in all the experiments that we do have, we use the same set of hyperparameters. So I guess the answer is like, yes, hyperparameters do matter. But once we discover a set that works well, then we just use them for all the tasks, right? I guess it's, you know, and uh, just inevitable for something like long horizon manipulation, where there's a lot of different things that happen at the same time that you really do need to tune a bit. But we found uh, just tuning on one task out of the three works well for the three tasks that we do consider. Mm. And do, do the different tasks you consider, do they have the same number of uh, uh, semantically uh, obvious uh, sub goals roughly, or, or are you yeah. considering, yes, roughly? Yeah, so th this one has four, right? So we actually just wrote out what we consider as the four stages, but uh, the model is not guaranteed to discover three, right? Like in this case, we actually discover like four pictures, right? But when we collected a demonstration, we had three sub goal in mind, right? So the point is that we don't necessarily need to discover the exact number of what we consider sub goal, but once you have enough demonstrations, then you know the general pattern of the sub goals to discover are roughly correlated. Like the set of sub goals for each video will be roughly correlated. That's why you can generalize at test time because for each training video, we roughly discover similar sub goals. So we can actually generalize and you reuse you know, sub goals. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's really cool. And what is the 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 trigger to discover a sub goal? Is it a, a, a continuity? So yeah, so uh, basically, it's whenever like you know the reward curve from the end like has a very negative slope, right? So there's a threshold that we use to you know uh, eliminate false positive, right? Because sometimes you know the reward curve is just had a little bump, but we want to make sure the bump is big enough in order to be uh, classified as a sub goal, right? Because otherwise there are a lot of noise in these demonstrations. You'll have like a lot of sub goals, right? Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Have time for one more question. Interesting. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I might have one. Um, so I've been I've been experimenting with Kind of similar pre-training ideas but on navigation problem and i remember mm -hmm. something we tried like in, in navigation problems oftentimes like your current sensors sensor images are not enough to kind of figure out where you are you would ideally want to condition not only on the current image but on a sequence of images right to, to kind mm -hmm. of have more context uh so yeah i just wanted i just wanted to know if you've ever thought of this problem of of including more than the current time step as an input to the network yeah, so we haven't in these works. So in all these works, I guess the value function is like Markovian in the sense that the observation is a single frame. But um, I think you can totally just augment the notion of observation to be a stack of frames, right? Like let's say every atomic input is no longer, yeah, maybe it's no longer a single frame, but rather like a sequence of, uh, you know, frames, right? And I think that's mm -hmm. very common in reinforcement learning. Like, let's say Atari. Like all the inputs are like stack of four frames, right? So you can do this here to account for history. But for all of our tasks here, we haven't, but I think that should be doable, right? Because the objective is still the same. Well, thanks. Thanks for your talk, Jason. I think it, that, that was a great talk. Thanks again. Um, and yeah. Yeah, fantastic work. Good to see you, Jason. Great yeah, you. thanks. Yeah, maybe I'll see you guys. At, I don't know, like Coral or Neurips, if you are attending. I'll see you guys there.
Okay. Yeah, probably. Yeah. All right. You. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Thanks so much for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.